Tom White, new co-host. Welcome to Sport and Life, our first Friday recording. How are you doing, mate? Teddy, I am top of the world. <laughs> Delighted to be on this esteemed podcast with my <laughs> esteemed co-presenter. And I'm very much looking forward to this and have been ever since you asked me. Yeah, me too. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun, isn't it? I think we're going to have good chats about football and other sports, maybe a bit bit of fitness as well, and just a, a laugh because I guess we're we're a similar era, aren't we? We've got a lot of the uh, nostalgia. You, you enjoy the football scenarios that I put up on Twitter, nineteen oh, nineties based, and we're going to get involved. We're going to chat a, a few about those. We're going to do your um, top five Sunderland heroes, I think, for this episode. But first, what I'll do is I'll give people. Um, we've got a quiz question, and then we're going to answer that at the end. I uh, get Tom's answer and then uh, I'll give you the, the correct answer because I had to write some quiz questions for a, a friend's book recently. And then uh, we'll we'll do the football scenario as well. And then we'll just kind of go through the answers to that that we've had responses on my Twitter account at the end of the podcast. But first, uh, the question for the pod, Tom, is who scored a winner in the 1993 League Cup final and then broke his arm in the post-match on-field celebration? Uh. So, Hold off. Too to e- I know that one. Yeah. I know that one. That's it's too easy. Too well, easy. Well, hey, by the way, anyone listening to this, no Googling it. All right. You just yeah, yeah. gotta Yeah, yeah, no exactly. Googling it. That's a good point. But the funny thing is you you'll say it's easy because I think you were probably nearly around 10 at the time and I was 11 or 12. And I think for that era, you always remember every detail, but older yeah. older friends of mine didn't remember it. And then maybe younger people won't obviously know about it. So it'd be interesting. I, to rem- see. I remember yeah. who dropped him. I remember it <laughs> like it was, I, I remember it uh, very well. It's, it's quite interesting saying Google in there because as you know, now that I do Good Morning Sports fans, we yeah. actually have a mystery player every day. Oh, cool. Where, yeah, of where the viewers can tweet in the answer. You give three guesses. In each break, so quarter past, half past, and quarter two, you give it a clue. Love it, yeah. Everybody tweets in hashtag GMSF, good morning sports fans, with their answers, right? And, uh, and then we reveal the answer just before 10 o'clock uh, in the morning. And um, it's it, some of the clues, it's so obvious that you, you, like, you can Google it. Yeah, and yeah. It, and it's so obvious. The one, it's quite hard for the production team to come up with clues that aren't Googleable. Yes, yeah. But they're brilliant. You know, when, when they do do that, it's abs- it's it's so good because you, you get people genuinely guessing and you get some absolute belters. I love it. So yeah. I'm all for this, but no Googling. Yeah, because you want it to be factual, but you don't, yeah, you kind of want it to be, yes, yeah, but you can't, it's not fun if you Google it anyway. Anyone can do that. That's the whole point. It's just uh, yeah, exactly what resonates with get- you. But they get their names read out on Sky Sports News if they get it right, you see. I love it. And what 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 time do you announce the what time do you give the clues away? So give the clues away. Quarter past nine is the first clue. Uh second clue is half past nine. Third clue is quarter to ten. And after that break, so about ten to ten, we reveal the answer. And the the first ten people who get it get the names read out. And I think awesome. that's what makes people Google it because they want the name read out on Sky Sports News. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that- it's it's fair <laughs> enough. Although your reaction to the quiz question, you knew it even before you probably would take you then Googling it actually. So if you do know a quiz question, it's quicker than even getting on your phone and, and looking for it. The thing about yeah, that exactly. question, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Actually. You know, I work the lates on sports news, so I might actually have to start uh, recording that. The Good morning sports fans are watching it back. Just to, yeah, you'd be good at it. Like you'd be good at it. Well, it depends. Yeah, the oldest, it depends on your era, doesn't it? I think like kind of that, that sweet spot of like 90s football, I'm definitely good on. But um, the thing about that is it's exact answers. But the football scenarios that I do is kind of up to your imagination. There's no real wrong answer. I can tell you what I was thinking when I thought about it. But the football scenario that we'll go through at the end is, is this striker latches onto a bouncing ball 30 yards out, nods the ball down, and whilst running left to right, so across the pitch, curls a right-footed 25-yard shot into the top corner. So it'd be the striker's right-hand corner past the goalkeeper's left hand. Who do you see as a striker? And Tom, you've got a good one, haven't you? You said coming up in a in a few moments we'll talk about. Yeah, well, the reason I think it's a good one is because we have such a good response to that. Loads of really good yeah. um, answers. And, and some people were actually saying a specific goal, weren't they? Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, the, and nobody said the first the first player that came to my mind, nobody said. Um, so I'd be quite interested to hear your reaction when I when I say who I think of. 
Brilliant. Well, I look forward to that as well. And the thing about the football scenarios is it's kind of an era attached to it. So people often visualise their kind of childhood heroes or the people when they were first, first in love with football that, that spring to mind. Or you do get some some modern ones. Some people always kind of say the same, the same player for almost every scenario if they're an Arsenal fan. It's always on real Bergkamp. But we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see what comes uh, what comes out there. So it's, I, I love doing them. Um, so let's talk about Sunderland, Tom. And I guess this plays into it. Your five heroes of Sunderland are they across the eras, or are they a sweet spot of eras for you? No, they are. They are very much across the eras. Um, two of them were playing in the first game I ever went to see. Uh, first Sunderland game I ever went to see, which was New Year's Day, nineteen ninety one. Um, if people are wondering why I'm, because I'm from Northumberland, which is mainly a Newcastle area, and the first game I ever went to. One of my godfathers actually took me to Newcastle v Portsmouth. Newcastle won 2-1. Mick Quinn scored two. He has since told me that his third goal that was ruled out shouldn't have been ruled out, should have had a hat-trick. <laughs> um, Guy Whittingham pulled one back for Tottenham. Um, John Burridge made a bit of a mistake in the Newcastle goal. And um, that godfather was kind of thinking that he could take me to Newcastle and I might become a Newcastle fan. But it's not like that up there. Mm. Um that I'm sure you've got people listening who are Sunderland or Newcastle fans. Up there, when you're born, you are told, right, that's your name, that's who you support. <laughs> and that's it. You, there is no yeah. there is no choice. It, it, it is very much. So when he was kind of saying to me on the way back, so do you think um, you're going to be a Newcastle fan now? Uh, you know, he tells me, I kind of looked at him quite puzzled and said, no, I, I support Sunderland. Yeah, it, it was as though he was trying to change my name. So who told you? Was it your dad? Was it your dad who said that there was a Sunderland well, fan? Yeah. So, so this is this is the thing. This is where there is a, a kind of um, a grey area. So, <laughs> my mum and dad, both football fans, both Sunderland fans, right? Yeah. So, no problem. My sister isn't even a, isn't a football fan, but she supports Sunderland because she knows she does because she yeah. had to. Um. So my so I'm a Sunderland fan. My son's mum, um doesn't like football. So that was easy. Mm. Your name, my, my son's name is Emmy, short for Emerson. It, your name is Emmy, you support Sunderland. Again, that's easy. Where it gets difficult is if both parents like football and both support a different club. Like in Liverpool, that happens yeah, quite a lot, yeah. Yes, that's where you might have it. So like, so, so but my, my son's uh, mum and I, we're not together. So I'm, I'm married um, to someone now who, is a football fan hmm. and she's a Portsmouth fan. So if we have a child and hopefully we are lucky enough to, yeah, um, that I have to accept that that child will have a choice between Sunderland and Portsmouth. I, I, I have to accept that. And Although, you'd be happy to take him to Fratton Park, would you? Uh, alternate. Well, I, I, let's let's not say happy. <laughs> right? I, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I would I would accept it because that would be fair. What I wouldn't accept is if they said, actually, no, I support. I mean, our where I live, our nearest, and we've got Reading, yeah. is probably the closest, Wickham. So their friends might support Reading or Wickham, although I must say around here, you, you see more Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea shirts. Yeah, um, well, that, that happens in the South. And obviously, I've, I've not got a Manchester. Yeah. I support United because my grandparents were from Manchester and I moved around a lot as a kid. I didn't, I was born in East London then moved all over, lived in the West Indies for a bit. So I didn't have a, you're in this area, you're from this area kind of thing. And because I had that connection with my dad with Man United and he was actually almost more of a rugby guy because he was he was a Welshman and, and loved loved Wales and, and rugby. But actually, um, United wasn't a choice for me. But in the south of England or generally below Birmingham and particularly even below, I think, the northwest, there's a bit more variety in that. Whereas it seems like the northeast in particular, it's like, you you know, yeah. you, you don't support Man United, don't support Chelsea. Yeah. You have to support one of Sunderland, Newcastle, or Middlesbrough. Which I know people will say Middlesbrough is not in the northeast, but there's a, there's a question. Yeah, mark. well, I, I must. I, I don't really put Middlesbrough in that equation, um, but really. Sunderland and Newcastle rivalry is so strong. It's not yeah. that we have got anything against Middlesbrough. The, the fact that we don't have anything against Middlesbrough kind of says tells the story. Really, it's our rivalry is so strong. We haven't really got time for another one. Yeah. But in the northeast, you're either wearing a red and white shirt or you're wearing a black and white shirt. That's that's how it is. Some people they don't know they're born. Teddy, right? Because <laughs> like there are some people whose parents don't like football. Yes. So they can support whoever they want. Yeah. Right. And they're the ones who like, although I wouldn't change a thing, I mean that is quite nice to just be able to support whoever's winning at the time. Because if your parents haven't told you who to support, 
why wouldn't you choose at the moment Manchester City when we were younger, Manchester United, slightly before our time, Liverpool? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you? And then there was yeah. Arsenal involved in that and Chelsea. So they're the, they're the ones that don't know they're born. And when you said that people kind of south of Birmingham, you often see see them wearing shirts that they've got no affiliation to. So I, I lived in Luton for three years because I, I went to university there. I don't think I saw a single Luton shirt. <laughs> really? It was all, it was all <laughs> Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester United. Um, yet when they went to Wembley to, and won the playoffs, and Luton were brilliant last season, by the way. They, yes. In my opinion, they definitely deserved to go up. I thought they were excellent. Um, everyone in Luton was at Wembley. Yeah. But none of them... None of them None of them support Luton. Well, they, well, they were. You talk about our era. They were in the first division just before the start of the Premier League, weren't they? And actually, they I were. wonder. I wonder if people, because they've been in the lower leagues, people are allowed to be a Luton fan and then have a Premier League team. Because there's some people that do that, isn't there? That's... Yeah, potentially because they went down. They went down to to the National League, didn't they? I think it was Conference when they were down there. So yeah, that, that's that's a good point. But they, I speak a lot. About, I wind my friends up. They're all celebrating, like putting pictures up with them at Luton, <laughs> celebrating uh, at Wembley. Sorry, celebrating. They're like, so uh, Liverpool. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, they're, they're doing well, aren't they? They're doing well. Like, well, who are you going to support when Luton play Liverpool? Oh, well, still Liverpool, but you know, like, I think it's, tr it's tricky as well because sometimes you, know, that. you have that pull sometimes for your local team. Like, I've lived in Cheltenham for 10 years now, and you kind of, you know, I like going down and watching a bit of League One football, as you, you would have done with Sunderland as well. And there's, yeah. a couple, there's a romance to that. It's a bit simply, you can go in five minutes before the kickoff, and, and they're the, you know, they're in the community, and it's it's people who are kind of working there and it's quite interesting, you know, it's a sort of salt of the earth kind of thing. So it's good. good I'm, to I'm a big non-league, big a big non-league fan. Yeah. Love going to local non-league non grounds, great atmosphere. Um whole families are there. Uh you can, you know, if 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 you like if you like to have a pint at the game, which, which I do, it's uh, you know, you, you you can have a pint. Um and the the when you're saying salt of the earth, the volunteers at non-league yeah. grounds. They do it for no, they work very hard for no money just because they love the club. And every year I host the um, Berkshire the the football in Berkshire awards, and ah, uh, so sometimes I get choked up by some of the winners. Yeah, because the um the amount of work they do, and when when I'm asking them, when they're telling their story about the amount of work they do, and it's just because they're keeping they're keeping that club going. Yeah, because they know that the whole community—it's it, it, a whole—it's not a club; it's a community. Yeah, and I get quite choked up. So I love going down and making sure that you know, spend some money on the gate. I take, take my son down there as well. Spend some money at the bar and the kiosks and stuff because because they deserve it. Yeah, but what you find down. is they all support the club, don't they? As well, whereas in the Premier, yeah, they League, do. Etc. Yeah, yeah. And the chairman don't always root for the club. They're they're there for business business reasons. So. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Sorry, I've, I've digressed massively. <laughs> no, I love it. Well, yeah, it gets a, it gets a taste of your your football kind of um, passion as well. But you said you've got you've gone across the eras. But where do we start with your Sunderland heroes? Yeah, so I'll because I'll, cause there are some there are some ob I've tried not to go for the obvious ones apart from what I've got one obvious in the five, um, and I've got a couple that my first one I think a lot of people listening won't have even heard of him, hmm. and there's one where I'd be very I, I'd. I, it will it will blow your mind that I've chosen one of them. Are these are these and, people? Have you not seen some of these people play? Are they before? I've, no, no, they're all they they, they start okay. when I start. Okay, um, and there's one where people will won't even remember that this guy played for Sunderland, right? Yeah, um, and I'll probably come to him last actually, but I'll start with with like I'm torn between two favourites really, but. <laughs> Um, when I've been on some podcasts in the past, I've always mentioned this guy first. It's a guy called John Kay. John right? Kay. Okay. Now he was a he was a right back, and, you, and people are going to think, well, "Why have you chosen him?" Right? I'll, I'll tell you. So I'm not when when I played football, you know, I, I was all right. I, I could pass. I could shoot. I was had a little bit of pace about me. So it, yeah. goal scorers aren't what really attracts me. Flair. You, you played fullback. I, well, I, I started higher up there, but I ended up. <laughs> I, ended up I ended up. Um, what really always used to impress me was the hard men, because I just couldn't do it. Mm. Like I'd back out at tackles, I'd jump and pretend I was I was going for a header, but really, I was jumping with a turtle neck. I didn't want the ball to hit me. <laughs> so the hard men have always uh, have always impressed me. Okay, so and John Kay was the hardest, right? And I'm going to give you a, a reason why I'm saying he's the hardest. 
So I was at a game, Roker Park, Donald's old ground, we're at home to Birmingham. We won 1 0. Lee Howie, brother of Steve, mm. with a left foot curler from the edge of the area. When I was young, I very rarely saw someone win. Went to yeah. loads of games with my dad. What year battle. was this? What year was this? So this will have been, we were in the old second division, what's now the championship. So it would have been either the 91 92 season or potentially the 92 93 season. But John Kay went in for a tackle as he does, broke his leg. Okay. Yeah. Tried to tried to stand up. Well, did stand up, mm. right? Okay. Wanted to play yeah. on. Went back. Went back down. He's broken his leg. All right. Yeah. Now, I mean that that's serious. The stretcher comes on. They get him on the stretcher. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I'd be I'd be having the gas and air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd probably be screaming. Yeah. I'd, probably be, I'd probably be crying. Right. I would be like I would be. In, I would react like most people would. John Kay, not only did he try to play on with a broken broken leg, oh. he was he sat he was sat up on the stretcher, kind yeah. of like, well, this is kind of like, well, this is inconvenient. Yeah. And then he starts, like, as though he's got a paddle in his hand, starts rowing like he's on a canoe. Brilliant. Broken broken leg, right? Imagine that pain. Yeah. He starts rowing, he starts trying to make the crowd laugh by rowing off. Okay. So and, and I'm sure there'll be footage on YouTube. There's, there's loads of images of it, mm. and he's even got a smile on his face with a broken leg. So John K, look him up. His nickname was the Tractor, <laughs> right? And as a player, he plowed through wasn't, people. Yeah, wasn't wasn't a brilliant player, but hard as nails. You couldn't get past him. Did his job proper, even though he's not from Sunderland. He's a Sunderland legend, a cult hero, um, and kind of that that encompasses the sort of the hard man yeah. mentality yeah. that people in the Northeast have because we, we're all in the Northeast, we've all either come from a family of miners, which was mm-hmm. my mum's side of the family, the men in my mum's side of the family were miners. They are the hardest people in the world. Or maybe the shipbuilders are the hardest people in the world. Either way, yeah. someone, everyone in the Northeast has either come from a family of miners or shipbuilders or both. I can't right. imagine you down the mine with it ruining your hair and your <laughs> your tan. I'm small enough. I'm small yeah. enough, but I, like, if if I was in that year, I'm more likely to have been a chimney sweep. To be honest, <laughs> I love it. But that's pretty the John K. the hero because you're right. There are, there are things that resonate with you as a kid and a young boy. We're both young boys. That about people that you look up to and, and just kind of doesn't have to be this necessarily the skill on there but just the leadership or whatever it is bravery that you kind of want to aspire to and, and emulate so that's john k where, where do we go for number two so the, the second one is an obvious one it's, it's niall quinn yeah um now not only was he a very good player um and and was at something for a long time really gave his all when it came to giving his all that stretched to when he retired because Sunderland was in a massive mess financially. The club needed to be sold. Mm. Um, yeah, Bob Murray had done some, you know, had been, had been, in my, my opinion, had been a great chairman and owner, but things had, were losing a lot of money. And Bob Murray, in conversation with Niall Quinn, and this, this is a problem. Niall Quinn was like, well, what can I do? You know, could I, could I maybe raise some funds for the club? He said, and Bob Murray's like, yeah, you could raise millions of pounds. It's not going to do it. And he went, well, I'll tell you what, leave it with me. And he put together a consortium. Niall Quinn and his consortium bought the club. Not only that, completely saved us and really backed the new manager that yeah. was there. Uh, you know, he appointed Roy Keane. Wow. He talked about being a magic carpet ride. And all the fans should get on it. We did get on it. We got promoted. Roy Keane took over and near the bottom of the championship. Yeah. We got promoted that season as champions. And it was all down. And I mean, sorry, a lot of it was down to Roy Keane and the players, but really the catalyst was Niall Quinn. And when you've got someone who he's not from the North, it'd be like John Kay, he's not from the Northeast. Niall Quinn is Irish, right? Um, but he came to Sunderland and fell in love. And I've got a quote. I was looking it up earlier just to make sure I get it right. I've got <laughs> just loaded it up because it, yeah, it's yeah. on my um, internet on my phone and it's it's loaded up as um bars in henley because uh my wife and i straight after that after this are going on the last we're going to pub corner in henley are I've you looking up pubs i mean looking at pubs <laughs> in henley so hang on Here i thought it was now quinn quote on bars yeah. in henley so i like connected yeah now quinn's quote okay 
towards the end of his time at Sunderland was. I learned my trade at Arsenal, became a footballer at Manchester City, but Sunderland got under my skin. Mm. I love Sunderland, right? Now, if you've got a player playing for your club yeah, who genu- genuinely has a proper feel for the club like that, they deserve to be one of your legends. And he was great on the pitch. He was, the, I think he was the first person to have a testimonial and give all the money to charity. Yeah. Which now everybody does. And then he saved the club when it was... Did, well, did, he, put, time, did he put his own money into the club as part of that consortium? I, I, I don't know. What, I, I don't know is, is no. the answer to that. Um, but he is the one that got the consortium together. Yeah. And although since then we have had lower moment at the time that was our lowest moment. Um and he picked us up. Since since then it, there's been lower moments, but that was after he went. That's, but it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned the other clubs he played for, and that I didn't realise that he'd been on record of saying that Sunderland was so special to him because I don't remember him at Arsenal. I knew he'd been at Arsenal, but I remember him also at Man City scoring goals against Man United in the derby matches as well. He was fantastic with that City team that had David White in it as well. And yeah. um, Mike Sheeran was it behind them. But then he, he must have he must have come to his prime at Sunderland quite late in his career, actually, or relatively decent age. Well, he came to Sunderland um, when we were our first season in the Premier League. Right? We've been in the top division, but well, we've won the top division several times, but our first season in the Premier League, we got relegated straight away. We signed Niall Quinn and he got injured for, for a year mm. straight away. And he got back to full fitness in the Championship. And then whether it was Championship or Premier League, he was just the same. Just He was he ended up having a late peak. I think that's probably your point. His, his yeah, peak yeah. was quite peak. Because everyone remembers Quinn and Phillips. That was, that was Niall Quinn's peak. And, and something to add to that, we are lucky enough in our jobs to meet some of our heroes, right? He is the nicest man I have ever met. Right? It's a relief, him, isn't it? Yeah, him it's and Sir brilliant. Bobby Robson. Him and Sir Bobby yeah. Robson um, are the gentlemen you are, well, sadly, Sir Bobby Robson is no longer with us, but they, the gentlemen you expect them to be, they are. Mm. And and it is so nice. And he's got time for everyone. Um, absolutely love that man. And I would have put him first, but... Because that was an obvious one, I, I went for John Kay first. But, you know, it, I know this isn't in, in any sort of order. Yeah. But if you were to put them in order in terms of someone, one of some of the biggest legends ever, you've, Niall Quinn has, has got to be because he did so much off the field, not just on it. I love it. Yeah, Niall Quinn. I like the fact that he played for other clubs as well, because I guess this is the point. He doesn't have to be a one club player like a Gary Neville or someone like that. It can be someone that moves around a bit. For me, one of my childhood heroes was Mark Hughes. And obviously Hughes, yeah. fantastic for United, but played for, you know, had a really long career as well. Played for Barcelona, played for Chelsea, Blackburn. It was really kind yeah. of well, well thought of. So I can see parallels with with that and also with a bit of the John Kay, because he's a very tough guy. Mark Hughes on the pitch anyway, softly spoken off it. Uh, who do we go well, where do we go for number three, Tom? Is Sunderland here? Well, be, be, because I've got two surprises, I'll leave those two till the end. So this one, again, this is an obvious one. If you ask any Sunderland fan who, who, their, who their biggest hero is, they will all say Kevin Ball. And I've got to say Kevin Ball. And we've gone back to the hard man here. Yeah. He was, I mean, I, I've heard him on, you know what? I've never met him and it really annoys me <laughs> because I've, I have met a lot of my heroes. I've never met Kevin Ball. And he knows how desperate I am to meet him. Um <laughs> Are you, are you nervous? Would you be nervous to meet him in case he's not as nice as you, you hope he is? Or is Well, he's... I know so many people that know him personally, so I actually know he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, th- this is the thing. Again, it's going over the John Kay things in terms of being a hard man. And he really was hard as nail. And, and he admits he used to love getting into a scrap. And he, he was actually, before he signed for Portsmouth, he was part of the Portsmouth firm. That would you know, and we don't condone this, of course. Really, but he was—he was a football hooligan, wow. right? When he when he was in his teens, he was—he'd he, go to Portsmouth. He's, like he's like that character in Mike Bassett, England manager. He yeah. Was, yeah, he he, 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 you know, he admits this. He would he would go to watch Portsmouth games looking for a fight, like like the 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 firms do, um, and he'd love a fight on the pitch as well. And this is the thing, and I know this annoys him because I've heard him say it. When you think of Kevin Ball, you think hard man, right? And and he was. And 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 when you hear people ask who their biggest hard men were, they're always torn between Kevin Ball, Mick Harford, who also played for Sunderland and is a Sunderland fan, 
yeah. and Billy Whitehurst. Do you remember him? Yeah. He, he, he was he's played for Sunderland before our time, but he played for Sheffield United. And everyone's torn. Everyone who played with those three, or against against them, I should say, say that they were the three hardest men, you know, all with connections to Sunderland. But I mean, the point is people would say Kevin Ball. But this is something that he doesn't get the credit for. He was a brilliant player. Yeah. I, I didn't I don't know what you think, right? But I always think right. How would you describe what? How did you describe what he was for people that didn't see him play? Like a sort of attacking centre mid, or no? He was a, so actually when I started going to Roker Park, he was a centre back, mm. but he was moved into central midfield in a four four two, and yeah. he would be the more he would be the more defensive one. Um, yeah. very very tough tackle, not that tall, but would never lose a header. He left He'd always get right footed. Right-footed, but this yeah. is my point. So when I think about uh, what makes a good player. What are they like on the volley, right? Because yeah. volley, that takes a lot of technique. Yeah. Was brilliant volley of the ball. If you think Mark Hughes was probably the best volleyer of our yeah. time. Kevin Ball, brilliant volleyer of the ball, but also, because you said it was he left-footed, he was he used both feet. That's what I was going to say. Play. I remember yeah. using his left and foot. Because yeah. when, when, I know that you're both-footed, right? And when I was a kid playing football, this coach gave me gave, gave us all this advice. He said, you know, when you walk along the street, you always kick a stone, don't you? Well, yeah. You know. He goes, well, you're not getting anything out of that, are you? So <laughs> kick it with your weaker foot. Interesting, yeah. But even now, I still kick a stone when I walk down the street, right? It's just habit. I always kick it with my left foot. Yeah. And it's like, he's like, you get nothing out of it. But if you kick it with your weaker foot, then maybe you are getting something out of it. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that's what Kevin Ball did, but Kevin Ball used both feet. And I love that. I love seeing that. Right. If you're centre centre mid, it just means you've got the options because the ball falls all around, especially in that era where you get knocked down. If you can't use both feet, you're going to have that delay, and an, an opponent can get exactly. in. Exactly. So he, he's um, so he used both feet. Great volley of the ball. Great technique. Um, and and you know he could really strike the ball as well. And he didn't. He doesn't get the credit of that purely because he was so hard. Um, but he's just you know people people call him Mister Sunderland. He, he um. When he when he, he left, he went to Fulham and Burnley after Sunderland. Mm. Um, and then when he retired, he came back as coaching. He had um, he had two yeah two spells as caretaker manager. Um, shame he never got shame he never got got the job both times. The people who did get the job did very well in fairness. Um, and he was then an ambassador for the club for a long time and only left about a year ago. Um, and you, you can't really have your top five Sunderland heroes without Kevin Ball. There isn't a single Sunderland fan who wouldn't have him in. And I'm no different. Yeah, yeah. So brilliant. We've got two hard men and a big man in the middle, John Kay, Kevin Ball, and, and Niall Quinn. So yeah. what about number number four? Well, I've got two surprises here. And if there's any Sunderland fans listening, um, and there will be because we're yeah. everywhere. Right? <laughs> the, 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 the song goes, Sunderland take over everywhere we go. And then... As soon as we start losing, the other fans think something get battered everywhere we go. Um, but we, this will the next two will be a shock to everyone. Mm-hmm. And I will go with a goalkeeper now, and everyone will be thinking, "Oh, he's going to go Tommy Sorensen. Oh, he's going to go Jordan Pickford. He's going to go Tony Norman. Whatever." It's Mart Poom. Mart Poom. Wow, who played for Derby as well? Did he? That's it. Derby. Yeah. Now, I have gone on record to say that Mark Poon is the most underrated player in Sunderland's history, or since since I've been a Sunderland, since since I've been going to Sunderland, Mark Poon's the most underrated player in our history. He was like a wall in goal, um, and like when, when there was a one on one, if someone went clean through, yeah. I've never been so relaxed. It's like, well, they're not going to get past Poon. Like Schmeichel. Yeah, similar, similar, and he was his nickname was the Puminator because he was like like the Terminator. Yeah. And uh, I remember a penalty shootout against Crystal Palace in the playoff semi final second leg. We we lost three two I think to Crystal Palace at Selhurst Park and beat them two one at home. And away goals. What year? Wasn't. What year would this be? Because I, I get foggy so generations. I get this. I get this exactly right because it was two thousand and two thousand two, two thousand three to two thousand four. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. We got promoted the next season. Mick McCarthy was manager. We we lost three two at Selhurst Park, one two one at home, and a lot of the fans celebrated full time, thinking the away goals rule had yeah. put us through. But the away goals rule in the playoffs had been had been abolished that season. So we went to extra time and penalties. And um, our penalty taking was horrific, terrible. And Crystal Palace must have had three or four chances to win the game. And Poom just kept saving it. Eventually, Jeff Whitley missed for us. I think it was Michael Hughes scored the winner for Crystal Palace. Brilliant penalty that Poom could do nothing about. But he kept us in it. Um, but I've gone all this time without mentioning the biggest reason why he is one of my favourites is he scored a goal. Did it? Can you remember it? It rings a bell, but I can't remember it. I can't picture Any, it in my mind right now. Anyone listening, right? As you're listening right now, type yeah. in Mart Poom goal. And it was against Derby, his old club. We were in the championship. Last minute, obviously, goalkeeper comes up for a header. Corner comes in from the Sunderland left. I think it was an in-swinger, right foot in-swinger. Not sure who it was, actually. Yeah. Um, and Mart Poom, right? Are you, are you looking it up now? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Sunderland keeper, look, look it up, Estonian. Look it up now. I want to see your reaction. It was it was for Sunderland <laughs> against Derby. It yeah. is the best header I have ever seen in my life, right? The best header I've ever seen. Wow. He, run, he runs oh, back. Pez Lynham's introducing it here as well. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah, wow. It's an out from the left-hand side. It swings out six yards, about eight yards out. That's a right-footed cross, sorry. Yeah, you're right. And he jumps... Goes over two players, one of his own teammates, yeah. in a, in a, in a defender. Has it got him? Has it got him running back? So he, he sprints back to his goal. Yeah, so yeah. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know this. The other team can take the kick off if there's nobody in the other half. Did you know that? No. Oh, you I mean, didn't know that. that's a good rule. Yeah. So one player does have to be outfield play. One player has to be in your own half, and the other team have to wait for you to kick off. If the whole team is in your half, you can actually kick up and go the other and score. A lot of people don't know that rule. That's all or nothing. Yeah, that's interesting. Poom, Poom did know it. So Poom is sprinting back. And there's great images of all the Sunderland players just looking at each other, fracking up, laughing. Because <laughs> Poom's got this proper Poominator, Terminator face yeah, on. Yeah, he's not looking at anyone. Sprint, just, yeah. Sprinting back. And everyone else is just like, you've got Marcus Stewart with a massive, like, smile on his face. They're all just cracking up behind him. That's an amazing. So Mark, it's a Mark power header, one, bullet header. Yeah, one of his most underrated player. Um, in, yeah, sorry, in That's my it. opinion, but also he scored that goal, and um, that that's what really puts him in my top five. I don't, I don't want to, I didn't want to make it five obvious people. Like I didn't want to say, I mean, obviously Philip Kevin Phillips would be in there. Um, special mention to Jermaine Defoe because his um his his closeness with can you remember Bradley Lowry, yeah. the young son of father. Um, that, that passed away with a rare form of leukemia called neuroblastoma. Um, his like special friendship with him. I mean, he 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 ended up giving that boy his uh, you know a really amazing end of his short life, and it, 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 it's it's so even thinking about it makes me so sad. But he, what he did was was amazing. You know, he actually became his best friend. Um, so a special mention of Defoe, but Defoe would have been an obvious one to yeah. go with. Um, Mickey Gray played for England. Yeah, of course, picked. Mickey Gray. Yeah. So did um, so did Gavin McCann. I've mentioned Kevin Phillips. I think Defoe played for England while he played for Sunderland. But um, Darren Bent did. Uh, he left under a cloud. Yeah. He was brilliant. So there were some obvious people to name, but I wanted to think outside the box a little bit. That's where Poom comes in, and also where my next one comes in. Go on then, go for it. Yeah. I will be shocked if you even remember that this player played for us, right? He was only on loan for one season. He was a left back. And this is where I was kind of torn. A few years later, he actually had a spell on loan at Newcastle, which would normally put me off. And it did for a little while. I was angry with him. Yeah. Time is a healer. What time period is it? So he was with, he is my most recent one. Okay, so he was with us in the season of 2012-2013. He went to Newcastle under Steve Bruce and then COVID hit. So 2019-20, yeah. he signed on loan in January. But um, once the season restarted in the summer, he, no, he actually didn't stay. 
I, I, I was going to say something like Julio Arca or something like that, but it's no, not. No, no, Julio, Julio Arca, Arca well. middle, middles, but he's still, he's still, see, he would have been an obvious one to choose as well. But you've got the right position. He was a left back. Mm. He was England's first choice left back for a long time. He was on loan to us from Tottenham. And he had a famous Danny cross. Rose. Danny Rose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, 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 Danny, Danny Rose, Danny, Danny Rose. And I've, I've gone for him not only because, that, I mean, that's, it's amazing that I've gone for someone who was only on loan for a season, right? Mm. But that season, one, is, and, and I can't believe I'm, I'm saying this ahead of Mickey Gray, he's the best left back I've ever seen in the Sunderland shirt. Yeah. Right? That's saying something. But why I loved him is because after he left, I would see him back at the Stadium of Light, just there to watch a game as a fan. He'd be back. Tottenham wouldn't be... Maybe Tottenham would play the day before. He would make the trip up. He, he, it seemed to me a little bit like Niall Quinn, mm. but not to that extent, that he fell in love with the club. And I remember there was a game, I, I was at it, actually. Um, and on this occasion, I, I was able to get into the, um, the players' lounge, actually. Um, Patrick Van Arnholt, um, through Clinton Morrison, got me and my uncle some tickets into the... Um, Good left-back as well, yeah. <laughs> but play it. Yeah, so we get into the, the players' lounge, and we were playing Everton. If we won, we stayed up, and it sent Newcastle and Norwich down, right, mm. with one game to go, and that one game was away at Watford, and it would have been, you know, would have been difficult. One Sam Allardyce was manager, and Danny Rose was there just supporting Sunderland. Brilliant. He's got a just. He knew it was a big game, and there he was supporting Sunderland. Is he a Yorkshireman? Who he supports? Leeds. Of he's from Leeds. Leeds he's, from, yeah. he's from Leeds. Yeah. Um, I think Tottenham might have signed him from Leeds as yeah. a kid so. um, and I just thought I love that you know now Quinn fell in love with the club good one mentioned Julio Arca there fell in love with the club and I have forgiven Danny Rose now for signing for Newcastle because it was such a brief spell but when, when a player starts loving the club you fall in love with them because you love the club that much you want to see that yeah yeah. So again, thinking outside the box, I, I didn't want to go for the obvious ones. And Danny Rose will shock everybody, um, but I, I loved him, loved him, and always sad that he never returned because I actually, you know, I, I think he would have done. It's what's well, interesting with the uh, with players like that as well. The players that move around that aren't from the area, but they resonate something. There's a kind of chemistry with the club, isn't it? I don't know what that is. Whether it's something that an experience in their early games in the team or, or what it might be. Like, you know, Peter Schmeichel at Manchester United, you know, it was a legend. Even though he played for City, people still don't hold that against him necessarily. But he, got, he ended up with a Mancunian accent and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So, I, I, think it, it, I think it probably helps for young footballers. Living in the North East is quite nice. I've got, I've got to say, if, if you're a party boy, um, yeah. it's obvious that, you know, there's a, a lot of the younger ones will live in Newcastle because it's party central. But Durham is also party central, by the way. A lot of people forget about that. And, and, and Sunderland's a good night too. Um, but what people will often do is that the youngster, they will live in Newcastle because they they like that. Then when they get a family, they'll move to Durham. And Durham is, be, what a county and what a city. Love Durham. Um, that's where all my family are from, Durham, which is which right. is why they're all Sunderland fans, by the way. I never really explained that. Yeah, They're Sunderland fans because they're all from County Durham and the whole family are red and white, which is why... Me and my sister were were, were 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 told we were even though we're from Northumberland, and I think um, I think people fall in love with the whole area and the people you speak. Yeah. Like, people are very it? friendly. My brother lives up in um, well near Rowlands Gill now, but it's just outside Newcastle. It's it's really yeah. Good. It's like I remember when I used to be for people that don't know my background. I started at Sky as a runner, so I was making the teas and coffees back in two thousand and four, and I um and, you know one one of the regular guests of the Champions League was Rude Hullet. And Rude Hullet had a terrible time at Newcastle. The fans mm -hmm. couldn't stand it, right? He, he, you know, he, he dropped Shearer and Ferguson in a derby, which we went on to win. Nice. We, as in Sunderland, went on to win at St. James's Park. And then he got sacked the day after. And I remember, like, talking to him about it. And I must admit, all the guests that we have at Sky, I, I, I love most of them. I was never actually that keen on Rude Hullet. But he did say something very interesting. Richard Keyes introduced me to him as, as a Geordie, right? Which, you know... Historically, actually, yeah. well, historically, Jordy actually covered it all. But people don't know that. You know, oh, really? So, so Jordy, you know, he he got that wrong. The Jordy's the Jocks, that. wasn't it? It was the Scots with the Jocks and the Jordy's. Jo oh, the Scots are still well. Yeah. Given given that I'm half Scottish, you know, I, I've got a claim <laughs> to it all. But, um, 
And I remember Root, he said, he said Richard Key said, oh, careful, you know, he's, he's a Geordie. And Root said, they are the nicest people. And these people didn't like him. Mm. And he still yeah, yeah. said they were the nicest people. And that's what it's like. I think you can get you can get an affinity with a club, but I think actually you fall in love with the the whole region and the people. Yeah. And I'm very proud to be from the Northeast. You know, I'm very proud of the Scottish side that I've got in me as well. Um, but I from the Northeast, we are and people can correct me if they think I'm wrong, but I believe that we are everyone knows how passionate we are about football but we're very passionate about where we're from. We love it when people praise the Northeast and we are loyal people. It's got a big sense of identity, hasn't it? I think the South of England, you've yeah. lived in the South of England, you don't have the same sort of fierce thing of like being in Berkshire where you are isn't necessarily, <laughs> disrespect people from yeah. Berkshire, it's not necessarily like something you hang your hat on because they, probably, they might move into the Surrey or they might, you know, go here or there and it's not a whole lot of difference around. Yeah, it's true. And and from from the by the way, northeast isn't the only place that's like this. Um, but it is it is very. I don't know if it's that some sometimes I feel, and I've I've said this on I've, I've been guests on Newcastle United podcast as well actually, and, and I've said this. Sometimes, I find myself defending Newcastle fans, even though I'm a Sunderland fan. Yeah. I, I don't hate Newcastle. That, let's make some very clear. I don't hate Newcastle at all. You know, I'm a Sunderland fan. That doesn't mean I hate Newcastle. I love the derbies, love winning them, hate losing them. But I don't hate Newcastle at all. Let's mm. make that clear. But um, I often find myself defending Newcastle fans because sometimes people might say, oh, yeah, Newcastle fans, they're deluded. I always say, well, hold on. They came very close to winning the Premier League under Keegan. They got into the Champions League with, I believe, I think Dalglish might take them to the Champions League. So Bobby Robson definitely yeah, took them to the Champions yeah. League. Yeah. They're in the Champions League now. Why shouldn't they aim high? Why shouldn't Newcastle fans think we should be challenging for the title? Also, I don't, there's many fans, not, the volume of fans they've got is up yeah. there with, with pretty much anyone outside yeah. of Man United and Liverpool, I'd have thought. But yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's add some to that as well, please, Teddy. Um, yeah. they, they, why shouldn't they? They've 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 been so close to it. They've been to at least two FA Cup finals yeah. in my lifetime and, and missed out. I think Arsenal might have beaten them in, in both, maybe, or maybe one might have been Manchester. I can't. Anyway, um, it's not my club. I don't need to know that. But uh, you know, I say that's not deluded. They got the two, not... they got two, two cup finals, ninety eight and two thousand, and lost to Arsenal and Man United. Yeah, I think. In those... Oh, that's right. So it was Arsenal Manchester. United. And they've been in the Champions League. They beat Barcelona in Barcelona, didn't they? Was it was it in Barcelona when Aspria scored a hat trick? Mm. I think um, I think Gillespie Keith Gillespie set them all up, yeah. and that's it's not deluded of them. Is it? I mean, that's that's not deluded. So I find myself defending Newcastle fans. And my point is, in the northeast, when it comes to that, if somebody attacks an area of the northeast or something, we defend, <laughs> we go together. We we will defend and then that's attack. Time and that's. That's the way we are. I think it might be the same in Glasgow. Yeah. I think it, it's definitely the same Merseyside. Yeah. Definitely the same in Merseyside. Actually, when I say Glasgow, actually, I think that might, I think even Scotland as a whole, actually, mm. I think that that's the way the nation is. And oh, I, I lived, yeah, lived in Yeah, one of my best friends is an Everton fan, but his mum's, give me this right, his mum is Liverpool, his dad's Everton, and he's got he's one of three brothers, two are Everton and one's Liverpool. So they kind of split down the middle with the family, but it's very much a kind of yeah, you, you you pick a team and then you go for it from from there, and it's within within families, and they're they're sort of defending that area. But the friendliness is true. Like that's since my brother's moved up there, he's lived up there about ten years, married a Geordie, and when you're up there, you're really struck by the fact how friendly people are. And as I say, I've moved around and lived in different places. I think people in America are generally friendly. They're very friendly to British people in particular. I think particularly outside of the big cities, you know, whether they like the accent and stuff. But then I think Northeast reminds me a little bit of Ireland. I don't know when you've been to Ireland, how friendly people are. You're in a bar in Ireland. Yeah come up to you and just start talking to you, which if you're in the South of England, particularly London, everyone sort of keeps themselves to themselves. I don't know whether it's there's so many people that you kind of, people shy away from that, but strangers will come up to you and just start chatting in, in, in yeah, North and in Ireland. Yeah. You see, I, I like that. See, so so when I said that my wife and I were out on a little pub crawl after this, we like to do that because, um, so so my, I have my son for a week at a time and then yeah. he goes to his mum's for a week at a time. So it's 50-50, but it's always from a Friday. So every other Friday, He'll be at his mum's. I don't work Friday. 
if my wife works on a Friday, it's only in the morning. So we tend to have a Friday afternoon, you know, just a, a few hours, you know, two or three pubs, two or three drinks, nothing, nothing major. And we we kind of like when we're doing that, we quite like chatting to like the the bar staff. Yeah. Or if there's if there's like someone in the pub, we quite like getting involved and chatting to people. And I think she's got that since because I'm like that. See, she's from the south coast, I'm from the northeast coast. Mm. She's kind of like picked that up from me. Because when when you're in the northeast, you do just chat to people. Yeah, and Portsmouth's got yeah. a different reputation as well. To be fair, hasn't it? I don't think it's always got the, the same friendly reputation in Pompey, but it's uh... it, it definitely has not got the same friendly. <laughs> I can assure you that very after <laughs> the amount of times that I've been to Fratton Park to watch Sunderland when we were in League One, and then we play, got them in the playoffs, we got them in the the final of the um, what was it called at the time? Capital One? No. What's it called? Oh, Checker Trade Trophy it was, yeah. which is now the... I'm glad we're not in that trophy anymore. Yeah. But anyway, we went, to, you know, we got them in that. We've played them so many times. And I've, I've got to say, as a fan base, Portsmouth are not friendly. All right? I'm not <laughs> saying there's a fan base at all. They're passionate, yeah. but they're not friendly. All right. So, But that that's the thing. It's, I, I, I like that when you're saying that people just chat to you. I'm like that. Yeah, I do too. I do too. It makes and life love, nice. It makes, it makes it yeah. life like, you know, more pleasantly. It's definitely yeah, good. Yeah, I, I love and I I love hearing when, when you say, "Oh, yeah, my brother's up there. He he loves it up there, and the people are all nice." I'm really proud to hear that. You know, I'd be yeah. devastated if it was. I'd be devastated if you said anything different. Yeah, no, it's really, really, really positive place. Actually, my sister-in-law's family is very, very friendly. Really nice to go up and chat to them all. And um, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Talking about Pompey just remind me of Francis Benali, Southampton legend, saying that he couldn't go shopping with his wife in Portsmouth. She had to go on her own because he'd get so much flack because the big rivals. Yeah, and I tell you what, it works both ways. So you'll you'll know obviously when we when we do um, soccer Sundays. Yeah, um, we often have Danny Cowley. Yep. Yeah. On don't we? Manager, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, lovely man. Now he was Portsmouth manager until, well, you know, midway through last season, and uh, he still lives down there. And he came in, I said, "How are you doing, Danny? You all right?" Because oh, I'm all right. And, you know, got up this morning. I was going, I went for a run down, down like I think he was saying he was down on the beach. He's oh, I'm having a lovely run. It's really nice. And then some guy just gets right up in my face and shouts Southampton, and walked on right because he was because he. He wasn't yeah. even Portsmouth manager anymore. He no, did it. No. <laughs> it's, it's similar yeah. to what you said. Well, that's one of those funny. rivalries you, you don't know about that's so fierce. It's a bit like the Swindon Town Oxford United one is really a bit vicious kind of rivalry that I didn't even know yeah. about. So you get and, and when you, when you, um, I've, I don't know if you've read Harry Redknapp's book. Oof. Oh, yeah. yeah it was actually yeah. quite, it was really, really um, mm. quite kind of. Life at risk type thing, yeah. you know. He's got, he did Bournemouth, Portsmouth, and Southampton. I don't think Bournemouth have got a particular kind of venom for for Portsmouth or or Southampton, but I think it's yeah different. Now. Yeah, Southampton, Portsmouth. But yeah, it's, it's a, a big rivalry that one. Love it, love it. Well, Tom, brilliant stuff. I love the five. We got John K, Niall Quinn, Kevin Ball, Mark Poom. Mm -hmm. And Danny Rose. Right, should we get on to the, the quiz question? Because you said you're going to nail it. So people have been waiting for this. Who scored a winner in the 93 League Cup final and then broke his arm in the post-match on-field celebrations, Tom? It was the Arsenal. I don't know if he was playing central midfield or right back on the day, but it was Steve Morrow. Yeah, Steve Morrow, which, uh, yeah, I remember vividly, but it's funny how people don't. But yeah, kind of um, quite a small guy, brown hair. And I remember he, he tumbled, he said off the player. It was Tony Adams, wasn't it, that he fell off his shoulders? Tony Adams. Tony, yeah. a Tony Adams dropped him. He, he later went on to play for QPR, Steve Morrow, but that's, like, he he scored the winner and he's actually not known for scoring the winner. It's kind of like, that's kind of a by uh, yeah. kind of uh, a, a, a side to the main story that he broke his arm. And that's why he was on Adam's shoulders was because he scored the exactly. winner. Yeah. I don't, even remember, I don't remember him playing for Arsenal much apart from that. That's the strange thing. Like, you know, so, I, I see, I don't think he was, a, he was never a regular in, in in my memory, but can you remember since, so that was the League Cup final, wasn't it? Hmm. Um, Arsenal against Sheffield Wednesday. Can you remember the two teams that were in the FA Cup final that season? It was the same two, wasn't it? Yeah. It was the same two. It was the same two, and um, poor old Wednesday lost both of them, which is gutting. Yeah, now I, you know, this is what I might have to do, but I think Andy Linigan might have scored the winner for Arsenal. Yeah, was it a replay? Which was it, a, one it, of them? Did, you know, you're right. It, I think it did go to replay. I think um, 
Chris Waddle might have got one. I've seen to think of David yeah. Hurst as well. Finished one, finish one one in the first one and then two one in the second. So was it? Did Linnigan score the winner? He did in the one hundred nineteenth minute. Yeah, right. Because they are two. Linnigan and Morrow would have been two players you'd never have thought of scoring the winner in no. that Arsenal star-studded side. Ian Wright. And it was Steve Morrow and uh, and Andy Linnigan. But yeah, I remember it well because that was ninety three. Because ninety two, someone got to the FA Cup final. Yes, yeah. Lost 2-0 to Liverpool. Liverpool, Liverpool. yeah. Steve McManaman was in that team, wasn't he? Arsenal 1-1 against Sheffield Wednesday, the first FA Cup final. So bear in mind, Wednesday, <laughs> already lost the League Cup final by this stage. And then they go to a replay. Uh, then Arsenal 2, Wright scored in the 34th minute, Linnigan in the 119th, Chris Waddle in the 68th minute. That was Waddle. Waddle. Yeah. And in, in the, the first... one-all, was, was it David Hurst in the one-all? Yeah, David Hurst, yeah. And what yeah, a player he was. he was. He was linked with Manchester United for a long time. They had some injuries, but he was great. He was two foot. Yeah. Well, Sheffield Wednesday wouldn't sell him, but also I think Sir Alex Ferguson wanted to sign him to play on the right wing in a 4 4 2. Did he? Yeah. So um He was a great striker, wasn't he? Very, very good. Very good. And you, you wonder you wonder if he's got to Manchester United whether whether his well, you'd think his career, well, he would have won more, I suppose. But, I, I, you know, I'm sure there's no regrets. Sheffield Wednesday, really. I like Sheffield Wednesday, actually. Good club. Yeah. Both Sheffield yeah. clubs, actually. United you know, probably signed Dion Dublin around that time instead. And then Dublin got injured and then Cantona came. So that's pretty... Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, it will be that. Yeah. You're right. that it yeah. will be that. You... Well, it's a small world. So we've got we've got Steve Morrow. I hope you out there got that as well. Um yeah, kind of a famous one for our era. Now this one, uh, football scenario, striker latches onto a bouncing ball 30 yards out, nods the ball down, and whilst running left to right, so across the pitch, curls a right-footed 25-yard shot into the top corner, past the goalkeeper's left hand. Who do you see as striker? Tom, before I get yours, should I run through some of the, the answers? Yeah, def- yeah right. definitely. I think, I think some of the replies have kind of flipped it, so it's from the left, haven't they? And, and oh, maybe they've of- got, yeah. That's interesting how your brain just... Twigs it a different way, yeah. So we'll see yeah. what people said. So Richie Firth, who is the drive time presenter on Absolute Radio, used to work with him years ago on the breakfast show there. He's an Arsenal fan. He's gone Alan Smith, not the Leeds one. I think I probably assumed with him it wasn't Alan Smith, the Leeds one, but Alan Smith, Sky Sports commentator, of course, now. Yeah, all right, yeah, good one. Fantastic, fantastic striker. Jamie McGill says that Tony Yaboa, and they've got a few likes. So that's a good shout, of course, for Leeds United. Yeah. Great, yeah. great strike particular off the, the bar from distance from just maybe left of central. Uh, Rob Malarkey, who is a sports journalist, has gone Shearer for Blackburn in the 3-3 draw at Palace on the opening day of the inaugural Premier League season in August 1992. Barry Russell, good one, Stan. Yeah, Collins- I, messed, I messed up with that one with Rob Malarkey. Did you see that I replied and then had to delete it? Oh, no, what did you say? So, he'd, I, for some reason, I thought that that was for Southampton. Ah, oh, did you? So I, re- I replied saying just Southampton question mark think, yeah. thinking you've said Blackburn you mean Southampton I thought see I know Rob Malarkey I used to work with him Sky Sports yeah. Radio what a great man and I know that his knowledge is world class and I thought if he said it's Blackburn then it must be Blackburn I looked it up and it was Blackburn yeah. I quickly deleted my tweet before <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was Southampton uh, my, my brother's put on there Owen who's a barrister Bebe I think he's being uh, ironic there with that one um, I think he Bebe. might be joking yeah uh, John Bailey says Suarez Wayne says Thierry Henry one of the original inside forwards cutting in from the left curling into the corner so he had the right kind of direction uh, Paul Dwyer says Shearer at Blackburn uh, Cy Watton says Alfie May formerly of, of Cheltenham legend I think it's called more goals oh. as a percentage of Cheltenham's goals than any other player in the football league I think Harry Kane was in the top three but Alfie May has got like 38% of Cheltenham's goals last season he's now gone to to Charlton Alfie May now what, who am I thinking of Scottish long hair that wasn't that's someone else no, isn't Alfie it? May's got short hair he's from, he's from Kent I think or South East London around that area he, uh, he scored a goal against Manchester City in the FA Cup a couple of years ago and Cheltenham played them and Cheltenham led Till the seventy eighth minute, so he's he's a good striker. Right. Basically, kept Cheltenham in League One last season um, with the help of obviously the rest of the players, but he's left the club, so hopefully they'll be be all right without him. Cyril Regis from Project Football Podcast is a oh yeah West Brom Coventry legend. I kind of remember him yeah, a little yeah. bit Coventry thing. Um, Neil Grayson. So this is all the people that follow me from Cheltenham. He's a, he's a Cheltenham former Cheltenham player. I think he played at Gateshead at the start of his career as well. Uh, Henri uh, Aaron Toner, Bob McNeil says only one answer. Bergkamp. It's interesting that, isn't it, that Bergkamp comes up there? Because and Henri, I don't really see him, Tom, Henri heading the ball down to himself like that, in that that sort of... Yeah. Clicking it up I'm, to himself. But. 
that I'm trying I'm kind of like visualizing the players and, and of the ones you can you've said, I can visualize she Yeah. Um thankfully in a Blackburn shirt. Um I yeah Henri and Burkham very different yeah, I can't actually visualize it personally. I think on, they both scored from that left-hand side a lot, but they were more kind of, Burkamp was curled shots and, and Henri as well. And it was usually Henri would flick it up to himself, the famous goal against United, isn't there? But he didn't really yeah. touch the ball. Neither for tall men touch the ball much with their head when they're playing, it seems yeah. to me. Um, Sparky, so Mark Hughes, we've mentioned him actually, uh, possibly could see, see Hughes. I can see that one. one. Yeah. I can see that one. Yeah, yeah. I can see that one. Uh, James Triggs says Van Persie, Arsenal and Man United legend, of course. He's So he's flipped it, hasn't he? He's, yeah, he's gone. on the left, yeah. Him with his left. From the right on his left, yeah. Which is yeah. fine, isn't it? Same thing. Yeah, no, I think it probably is. Henri again from Shane Burke, which I think just is the fact that Henri played a lot on the left and cut inside on the right. Uh, Jamie Birkbeck says Alan Shearer. Uh, Jarvis Reiner says Suarez, which is 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 quite interesting, isn't it? I can see Su- Suarez did head the ball down quite a lot, bouncing balls, because he's quite a shorter guy, wasn't he? And then he'd, he'd be good from yeah. distance, not curled shots. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I could, yeah, could, could maybe Ritchie. see that one. Ian Richards says Super Kev. So that must have been off your retweet. Oh, ah, yes. Get in there. Super yeah. Kev. Yeah. Super Kev. It doesn't matter what kind of goal, put Super Kev down for it. Kevin Phillips was a builder until he was 23, wasn't he? Is that right? Or was he something else until he was uh, on league? No, he was, he, was at, he was at Southampton then. Watford, I think. I, I don't right. think he was. Oh, he came no, to the game. Well, he played fullback as well, didn't he, at some point? Was that right? He, I think he was a right back at Southampton. And then yeah. when he went to Watford, they put him up front, and that's when we signed him. I An think it's that right amazing. Yeah, he was, he was brilliant. He, well, he came on my. He came, I had two stag views. He came on one of them. He came on my Durham stag view, and obviously he's a, he's a legend up there as well. Oh, yeah. So it was kind of like kind of had to like stand around like a force field to stop everyone mobbing him. That's been like it's like me having Eric Cantona on my stag view. It'd be ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably would be, actually. I think it'd be a good night out uh, from what people have said. Um, what about, uh, so Mark Stringer says Suarez as well, and then Dennis Bergkamp, Martin Godwin. So it's almost like Bergkamp and Henri have been the, the most familiar ones there. Tom, give us your your thoughts, what sprung to mind. Yeah, mine straight away with Michael Owen. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, interesting. And if you, in your mind, I know if you start picturing Michael Owen doing that, you immediately start thinking of his goal against Argentina. Yeah. In the 98 World Cup, but he put it in the other corner there. Yeah. I'm not sure if he actually headed the ball down. I think he but did that, earlier. I think it did it bounce up from Beckham. He did something with it, didn't he? When Beckham played. Right, yeah. he, he did used to run across the defenders and, and shoot. Um, and Owen was, he, he would have broken the record, England's record. I'm, I'm certain of it, had it not been for that injury. What's the, have you read his book? Have you read no, his book? No, I it's good, actually. Um, I might, might have that. I'm, I, that. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not sure. I don't what, think I have. What's the muscle, not the front of your thigh, the back of your thigh? Is that your hamstring? Hamstring, yeah. Right, well, that was his issue. Yeah. He, he he injured it badly and it never recovered. It was like the, the nerve. Tendon- yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not a sports scientist or, or a doctor. Obviously, I'm not a doctor, but um, if you like the, the tendons or whatever they were, mm. they were all, rather than healing properly, they were all attaching to the wrong areas. Whoa. And it took years and years for anyone to realise that. And I think there was some botched surgery in there as well. And he lost all of his pace. So he, he adapted his game and was still a quality striker. But his pace was what set him apart from everything else. And um, and he would have he would have broken Lineker's record, which has since been broken by Rooney and Kane now, hasn't it? I think. Um, yeah, that's by, by both, yeah, because uh, Rooney's got... What did Rooney, I think Rooney was 53, took it to, wasn't he? I think Kane must have 54 or something like that. Because yeah, Bobby, Bobby Charlton was 49, wasn't it? Yeah. And then Lineker was 48. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. And so that, that, that's who I picture doing it. I, I picture I picture Michael Owen. Um, he a, was electric little... for, for younger people, for older, younger people. But that 98, 99 season, after the 98 World Cup, I remember thinking it was a bit like Gazza after the 90 World Cup, actually. It was almost unplayable, Michael Owen, wasn't he? He just scored. And with that pace, he dribbled past people in the space of a few yards in the box and just be phenomenal. And it was just the kind of pace that you almost can't believe. is He's so quick. I remember watching him in the Victory Shield, that England under-15s, and everyone yeah. was raving about him. And that kind of sticks in your mind, doesn't it? And then when he, when he started playing for Liverpool, he, he like burst onto the scene. And was uh, and was brilliant. And that injury is such a shame, such a shame. Because yeah. I mean, 
We need to bring the victory shield back. I used to watch that as a kid on Sky Sports. That was quite good, actually, seeing the young players, wasn't it? I think I remember it seeing probably, my kids that as well. It probably is still going. It's just we, maybe we don't have the rights anymore, maybe. I mean, I'm sure it is still going. Yeah, well, I love it. Well, Tom, thank you for being on the pod. Look forward to uh, coming on again soon. We'll get another one up very soon. And um, I guess we'll, we'll get, put a new scenario out on Twitter. You'll retweet that as well. And yeah. maybe you could think of a quiz question for, for next time. Flip it around. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, definitely. I'll do that. And, fo- and how to follow you, Tom, if people are new to, to Tom White Media? <laughs> oh, yes. So I am exactly that. So I'm at Tom White Media on Twitter. I don't really tweet that much myself. I, I you know, I need it for work. I don't yeah. um, tweet that much. But yeah, at Tom White Media on Twitter. And my DMs are open, by the way. And I am at Tom White Media on Instagram as well. And in terms of my uh, on Sky Sports News, I do Good Morning Sports fans. 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I do Soccer Sunday. Uh, Teddy and I share that between midday and 6 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Love it. Always love seeing you on a Sunday. Great to catch up, Tom. Looking forward to doing more of these. Speak soon, my friend. My pleasure.